second batter down here to keep the heel out of tension. So that was another fallacy in the drawing that they were given. And then he made these political promises about uh, having enough water for one year's supply. He made that promise in 1922 to the uh, city's board of public service commissioners. Now what happened is in 1923 and 1924, the consumption went up because the city was growing like crazy. It's 500 square mile city. And so um, what they had to do was he just kept raising the dam. But the base was already fixed. So they raised the dam twice. Now, when the dam failed, there was a Stephen Stage recorder up here at the top of the dam. And it had a record like this. It comes down here at about 8.30 in the evening. It starts dropping. The reservoir starts at a, a drop. And then a very, very rapid drop. And this is what was recorded with a pencil up there on top. But when you look at this thing, the 12-inch diameter uh, galvanized steel casing is bent going to the south not to the north. If it failed first over here, you'd expect the whirlpool to have gone that direction, wouldn't you? So this is really kind of interesting. Then we start looking at pictures down at the base of the dam, and there is the ladder that they had affixed to the back of the dam, going down the dam. There's a wooden ladder. You could go down, and that is sitting in a crack, a huge, humongous crack with a bunch of vegetation stuff in here in the back of the dam. So you have a dam section 205 feet high with a monstrous heel crack. Ah! <laughs> Death. You had tension in the heel of the dam. That is not good. So when you calculate that in there, this is this is incredible, uh, incredible stability problem. Well, here's what's going on. <laughs> You have the hydrostatic force come down here, and that equal force right here is an uplift right here. And yet, you had uplift relief wells, some of them underneath the dam, but just the main portion of the dam, not the sloping abutments. And any arch dam or any gravity dam, the most dangerous part, which gets the least attention typically in the old days, is the abutment sections, because that's where the stresses are changing very, very dramatically, as you get, especially if you have like a one-to-one -one side slope, which this dam had. But if you had a crack in this heel right here, under full reservoir head, that takes your resultant thrust out of the middle third and moves it about 240 feet downstream. So what my Stevens gauge is recording right here, it's very easy to show, is the tilt of the dam. Right immediate to catastrophic failure. In fact, it doesn't take, how much tilt does it take to get that thing? It's about one degree of tilt to give you the exact record that we had on the Stevens gauge. So that explains the 3.667 inch drop. Oops, <laughs> sorry. That explains the 3.67 inch drop of the reservoir recorded 40 minutes before the failure. It's a half degree, I'm sorry, not one degree. One half degree tilt would give you exactly what was recorded there. When Mulholland was uh, cross examined by the district attorney, uh, they fumbled around a lot. Their story, uh, you know, where are the cores? Well, we did cores. We never did any cores. They never tested. No one does any, any stability calculations on this dam. They just took the design from Weed Canyon and, quote, made it fit San Francisco Canyon. That was very clear from the testimony I read. See, nobody who's read that previously was a civil engineer. It was always historians. Right? If you're an engineer and you're reading all this testimony, uh, it leaves you very little doubt that it's mostly smoke and mirrors. They keep promising to bring the records and you know, blah, they never, they never produce any calculations, any records, any pictures of any cores. They didn't do it. And what they said is, which, which I believe this part, is that they, they used uh, Turneau and Smith and Wegman's text, which were the three preeminent texts of that day, and they basically copied their stability analyses for a masonry gravity dam and used it, and that's right. It comes out exactly like what's in those books, because those books uh, did not appreciate uplift pressure until after this dam failed. This was the poster child of you better watch out for uplift pressure in the design of dams. And so when they when you run the design that they said, this is uh, Prescott Falwell's Water Supply Engineering, third edition, 1926. Falwell actually shows you the resultant thrust if you assume full reservoir pressure and absolutely impervious concrete, 
They all assumed that at the time. They all assumed conduits are pervious. And this would be the result would be with the dam's dry weight, this would be with full reservoir pressure and uplift. So he said, you're okay. See, because you're still just inside the middle third. But you have to tilt the dam out over here to keep the heel out of tension and put your cutoff back up here. Now, problem is when this dam fails and everybody looks at pictures of it, they see water weeping out of all these um, cold pore joints. There's hundreds and hundreds of cold pore joints and water is weeping out of them for weeks after the failure. And everybody's going up there looking at that and saying, the water got into the concrete. Now, we didn't find that out for sure, for sure, till Hoover Dam, because that was the first dam that had internal embedded in situ instrumentation by Roy Carlson, who was Jerry Rayfield, my mentor's mentor, and Roy was still alive. He wanted to be 94. He was there teaching at Berkeley. And Roy told me, you know, when they, when they put these in the Hoover Dam and they brought the lake up, they got a near instantaneous pore pressure response. So the concrete in the dam, 100 feet from the upstream face, is feeling that reservoir pressure within a few hours. And I said, why? He said, we don't know why. He said, some people think it's uh, micro cracking, micro fissuring, you know, we don't know why. He goes, that's the difference I said, you don't know why? And he goes, Rogers, that's the difference between scientists and engineers. The engineer just has to know that it happens. The scientist drives himself nuts trying to figure out why. The engineer doesn't care why, he just has to know that it does happen. 